Hey, this is Angelo John Lewis for the Sacred Inclusion Network. And I'm here with um, Jim Hickman, who um, we're honored to be hosting, who will be doing an event for us that's called, we're calling Parapsychology in You. And among other things, um, Jim will present an overview of recent developments in neuroscience and consciousness studies. And will then lead us through a series of activities aiming at expanding our sense of what it means to be human. But before we get into all that, I've got to introduce this extraordinary man. Um, those of you that aren't familiar with him, Jim is a co-founder of Ubiquity University, and it's a pioneer in, this, in studying the frontiers of consciousness. Going way back in the early 70s, he spent three decades collaborating with Soviets, researching exceptional human abilities, including parapsychology, all moves of, modes of healing, accelerated learning, and shamanism, and what the Soviets called then hidden human reserve capacities. He was also an assistant to the legendary Stanley Krippner, and we'll talk about that, the pioneer researcher into the study of consciousness. And he worked with him at the Mayamonides, I know I mispronounced it, Mayamonides Hospital Dream Laboratory. And with Krippner's encouragement, he worked in the area of Kirlian photography and managed to capture some uncanny images with the Israeli psychic um, Yuri Geller. More close to the current, um, time, he and his lifelong colleague, um, Jim Garrison, transformed the Michael Fox funded, founded Wisdom University into Ubiquity University, where he teaches a popular applied neuroscience course, which provides students foundational principles for use in developing enhanced cognitive, emotional, and spiritual skills. Now, I said all that, that's very formal, but I want to tell you a couple informal things. This guy, his, his first meditation teacher was Michael Murphy. The counter, the, the co founder of Esalen Institute. Those of you a certain age, that means something. Him and Murphy were the principal founders of the citizen diplomacy movements during the heart of the Cold, Cold War. And in this capacity, created a series of scientific and cultural exchanges between the US and the Soviet Union. And um, yeah, anyway, let's get started. Welcome, Jim. He's looking at me and giggling. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Angelo. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting to hear someone else describe one's life trajectory, you know. And one of the things I've learned as I've gotten older is when you look at your life trajectory, then experiences, commitments, passions one had early in life often show their true meaning later. And that's a part of, of what we're gonna talk about, the trajectory of the time in the 60s and 70s when parapsychology was really seen as a very controversial um, and, and uh, somewhat unscientific exploration of human possibilities with many, many detractors, um, people who, um, believe, who believed such things weren't possible. And if we go then over the last um, 60 years to now, we find that a great many of the, uh, in a sense, personal, uh, possibilities that were being explored back then are now actually being applied by many, many teachers around the world in, a, in the context of opening us all into our greater capacities to what I call become more fully human. Um, so uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity, Angelo, to talk a bit about this. Yeah, and, and, you know, um, Jim, um, there's a lot of people nowadays in this kind of instant age that uh, they come out and maybe they've written a book or an article and they're teaching something. Um, but you, um, uh, forgive me, you have, a, you have a background, which I think um, gives you some credibility in this subject. You're not, you're not a Johnny come lately with this sort of whole subject. And, um, you know, I, I think it'd be at least interesting, at least for me, <laughs> to hear you talk about some of those old days and we'll contextualize them, in, as you say, in this sort of context of now and what it means and what we've learned. 
And uh, you know, you I think you paint a kind of a rosy picture as to how parapsychology is now um, accepted. It's accepted by some people, but the the larger academy thinks it's a bunch of hooey, basically. You know, and and it it's I don't think it's as kind of universally accepted as um, um, maybe you might think. But anyway, that's just my opinion. So anyway, um, let, let, let let's get started. You know. Um, uh, I consider you um, kind of one of the people that was sort of like there in the beginning uh, of this. And, um, you know, as, as, as you said, we, we talked about um, your work with, uh, with Michael Murphy or, or something. But I wonder if you could briefly describe some of the early work you've done with this area, particularly with the renowned psychologist and parapsychologist, Stanley Krippner. And probably you should say a few things about Stanley Krippner, because maybe some of the people don't know um, what the enormous contributions this man's done in many, many different areas, not simply parapsychology. Yeah, uh, Stanley really uh, um, is one of the more eminent psychologists in the world, actually, as, as has been shown um, by the um, numerous accomplishments and contributions he's made to psychology in general. Um, and uh, recently was um, awarded um, by the American Psychological Association, the Lifetime Achievement Award that is given to, to um, people whose lives have been outstanding in the whole field. From child psychology, he's written a very good book on, on overcoming um, the, the challenges of, of soldiers after war um, and, and spent a lot of time uh, in the whole area of consciousness with parapsychology being a subcategory of possible um, um, human capabilities. And, and I, what I will, especially in, the, in our May 21st session, what I will go through is not an attempt to show that parapsychology today is formally accepted by everyone, but rather how much of what was parapsychology has been now taken out of that scientific or, or, or non-scientific frame and applied in a variety of ways by a number of teachers um, um, to help many, many people open up to capacities within them that um, have unveiled themselves in a sense over the last several decades, some of which related to some of the early work in parapsychology. I came to know Stanley in the summer of 1969. I had spent the previous year or two um, reading extensively on, um, on historical and more current um, uh, treatises on the whole range of consciousness. For me, um, from an early age, um, I, was, I, I have been interested in what I call that place where mind and matter meet. And for me, that encompasses the notion that, in a sense, the body is a manifestation of a spiritual or more fundamental foundational principle in the universe that gives us access to wide ranges of perception and capabilities that we'll um, describe a little bit of in our conversation today. Just one story, for example. And I tell this because in my current um, uh, courses on applied neuroscience, uh, some of which are, are oriented toward young people between the ages of 18 and 25, I find that the younger generations are more open to many of these ideas than my generation was, for example. So um, a story that, that has always been instructive to me is that when I was about five or six years old, um, my parents always 
um, instructed my brother and me to pray before we went to sleep at night. And so we would kneel next to our bed and we'd both say this prayer, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, etc. And then they would say, and now thank everyone you can think of for the contribution they've given to your life. And so God bless Aunt Les and Uncle Bernie and and, and, and and one of the things I learned from that is I learned at an early age the value of gratitude. And we'll talk about that because that's become something that uh, most of us know is now a recommended practice daily to just write down five things that you're grateful for at the end of each day or begin the day uh, as one lies in bed for oh, I'm so grateful for this comfortable bed I lie in. I'm so grateful for the sun shining in my, so that, because that has a huge dramatic and positive impact on our health, both mentally, emotionally, and physically. And, and then back to my story of my five-year-old Jim kneeling next to his bed, we would lie and we would go to bed. And I remember distinctly how I would lie there, not, lights were out, and I would say, okay, God, now let's talk. So, and I, I don't remember that God ever talked to me, but uh, it reminds me that at a very early age, I knew that there was a bigger context, one might say, for our life experience than just what was going on each day in our body, which was related more to the outside world than to the inner world. And what we are learning now is that living from the inside out is a more constructive and positive and productive way of being in the world than spending our whole life ref in reference to the outside world telling us who we are. So in 1979, um, I called Stan Krippner. I was uh, staying with my parents in New Jersey and um, I knew he was in New York. So I just called him and said, Dr. Krippner, I would like to come and, and work with you. And he said, come on up. So that summer, I became his research assistant at the Maimonides um, Medical Center uh, where they had a dream laboratory. And Krippner at that point was one of the leading researchers in, in looking into how altered states of consciousness might give us access to capacities, parapsychic capacities particularly, that are not normally available in our waking normal state of consciousness. So dreams um, were, in a, were seen as a possible way into that deeper part of our knowing in a sense. And in the laboratory then we would work with people who had demonstrated psychic abilities in one way or another in the past. And they would sleep in the lab. And once they went to sleep, a set of images would be selected randomly um, at some distance from the laboratory. And a sender would concentrate on the image that had been chosen and attempt to influence the dream content of the person who was the subject, the experimental subject. And then monitoring their brain waves, we would awaken them at the end of a dream state and ask them to report on their dreams, which we would record. And that would happen four or five times a night. And then in the next morning, we would give the dreamer um, a number of images that were the random ones selected out of which one target had been used and asked for them to identify what they thought was the target image. Um, and then over time, um, several of these subjects um, were shown to, you know, again, scientific, statistically significantly choose the target image. Um, so that got me involved in the scientific side of, of trying to determine if something um, extra normal, we might say, or paranormal was actually occurring 
with someone who had demonstrated some degree of such capacity in the past. And I remember it um, because I remember it fairly clearly because my favorite experiment was Stan was also friends with several members of one of the most popular rock and roll bands of the day, the Grateful Dead. And there was a period during that summer that the Grateful Dead did a series of concerts there near in New York, near the laboratory. And so um, I got to go to the concerts and our experiment was the dreamer was in the laboratory some 15 miles away and we would select an image and at, at a break in the concert, we would project the image on the screen wow. and instruct the 15,000 people in the auditorium to concentrate and send the image back to the laboratory in Brooklyn. Wow. And for me, it was like, now this is an altered state of consciousness that we're looking at here. We have 15,000 people in an altered state of consciousness. And, and, um, and those were the kinds of experiences that Krippner um, integrated into his research that kept me, you know, very, very involved in, and, um, and excited in a sense. Um, then 1970, Ostrander and Schroeder came out with a book, Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain. Yes, I remember that. And book. that was a seminal text that interested hundreds of us around the world who were doing this research and all of a sudden the fact that the Soviet Union was carrying on a fairly significant research program in parapsychology or what they called hidden human reserves, the extended possibilities of humans. So at, with, with Dr. Krippner's uh, support, I looked particularly into one area that they were studying that was named after the founder called Curlian photography, which was, or high voltage photography, where you use a high voltage field and, um, and, and place objects in it, including uh, a finger or a hand, and, um, and notice that a photograph of the field often would reflect uh, some, some unusual event that was occurring within the mind or the, or the concentration or the focus of the person. So I use this with, as you mentioned, um, a, a well-known Israeli psychic named Yuri Geller, who at the time was one of the most popular um, psychic performers, we might say because he would do demonstrations before large audiences in auditoriums in different parts of the world and demonstrate his psychic abilities, which of course were not under scientific conditions. So all the detractors would say, he's just a magician. Um, and and you know, a part of the a part of my interest in this is the the the, the perspective, the mindset, the psychological predisposition we all carry with us about the way we see the world. And so many of the detractors, um, while often identifying um, charlatans, one might say, um, also negated the possibility of, of potential um, true events that were occurring because they didn't believe it was possible. Mm -hmm not because they showed it didn't work. So um, I uh, was able to do some experiments with Yuri Geller in which um, we placed his finger on a photographic piece of photographic film in a, in a high frequency field. And we could take a picture of the, of the electronic field around his finger, okay? And so in this case, we then suggested to him um, make a circle around your fingertip. And the image that came out was no longer his fingertip, it was an actual circle that was illuminated. And then we said, what about a triangle? And the same thing, not just his finger, 
but an actual triangle appeared on the film that was illuminated by an electronic field. And then we took a, a watch and placed it on the photographic film and I put his finger some distance away and said, now Yuri, see if you can send some energy to the watch. And the picture showed a, um, a, a line of energy emanating out of his finger to the watch. So this sort of um, technique became, you know, very popular in sort of identifying that people could, what we now understand, affect their, their electromagnetic field in such a way that it would, um, that it would go beyond what a normal body um, um, operates from, in a sense. So in 1972, there was an international conference in Moscow sponsored by the Soviet Academy of Sciences that was about exploration into human hidden reserves or psychic phenomena. And Stanley and I went to that. You know, it was the first time US scientists had, re had reported at an annual, at a scientific conference, research that had been done in the US and mine particularly that replicated Soviet research. So they were very interested in that. Um, now, at the same time, this is a controversial subject in the Soviet Union as well. And the first day we, um, we arrived at the conference center, it was locked and there were KGB police standing outside. And they said, you're not allowed to be here. You're, wow. you're not allowed to talk about this in the Soviet Union. And so the, organi the Soviet organizers then moved us to a, um, a, a less officially sponsored place, we might say. And we were able, because there were probably 15 to 25 other scientists from Europe and other parts of the world, and we were all, we were able to have a couple of days of good conversations and presentations, but it was always with the, under the guise, under the, you know, with, with, with sort of corralled by the KGB police to make sure that nothing got out. And I remember at one point, the, um, the organizer, Edward Domov, who was a fairly well-known personality in the parapsychology field in the Soviet Union, um, we wanted to talk about some things that we didn't want to talk about with the whole group. And so he gave us instructions about how to take a metro and buses to a part of, Mo uh, of the country outside of Moscow and then walk through a path into the woods and in the woods, there was a clearing and Namov and two of his colleagues were there. And we sat there so that it was certain nobody was listening. <laughs> we sat there and talked for about two hours about oh. a variety of things related to, you know, the militarization of parapsychology, for example, the possibility of such things, et cetera. Um, and, and the next year, we all met in Prague Czechoslovakia. Um, and that conference was a more formally sponsored and, um, and, and um, definitive conference on the range of things that were being done in a sense behind the Iron Curtain, including um, uh, a, pa a, a man named Roberta Pavlita who created what he called a uh, psychotronic generator, a metal um, um, instrument that psychics could infuse with psychic energy and then you would move it away from the people and it would cause objects to run around on the table, et cetera. It was controversial, obviously, but the, an example of what was going on in that part of the world. And what it illustrated to us was the difference between what was happening in the US and Europe in the, in a sense, outside of the Soviet Union and inside was that in the US, we were still trying to prove it existed. In the Soviet Union, they were applying it. And it wasn't any longer about, you know, 
should we prove this? It was about, if this is true, how can we use it? Mm -hmm. And so they began to, there are two good examples that we learned about um, and how they applied it. One was those of you who are listening to this and remember back then, um, one of the great accomplishments in the Soviet Union was they had uh, two or three of the best chess masters in the entire world. They won the global chess events every year. Well, one of the things we learned was that in their training program, they developed people who they felt could project their thoughts or their influence at a distance. And at all the chess matches, they placed two or three of these people in the audience. And with the idea, not that you could implant a specific command in the mind of someone else, but knowing that the brain runs on electronic um, impulses, the idea was if you could just influence that a little bit, then you muddle the mind of the person and a chess player might make the wrong move. And they did the same thing with the White House. They wow. built a, a replica of the president's office in the White House. And they had a team of psychics over a period of time concentrating 24 hours a day wow. on the president with the idea that not to make him do bad things, but just if we can confuse him a little bit, then when there's negotiations going on, maybe we get the upper hand. So, uh, so we learned about what was going on over there in the application of this, mm. not just trying to prove it was real. And then um, that I, I uh, Dr. Krippner and I then went to um, um, Sonoma State College in California where Krippner became a professor and I was his assistant. And together we taught courses in parapsychology and consciousness, healing and shamanism and related areas during which I did my master's thesis on the kind of experiments that we were doing, which included the Uri Geller experiment, but also um, we worked with a man named Matthew Manning, who was a, who came from Cambridge, England. And at 11 years old, he began to um, demonstrate some unusual capabilities that manifested ultimately in some psychic abilities. Um, and the thing about Matthew, because he was, he um, uh, came to our research center in San Francisco um, and, uh, and spent three, four weeks with us and at the University of California Davis where they also had some research similar going on. And the interesting thing about it was that it was very hard to, to control what he could do. But when he, for example, a, um, a television network did a special on him, an interview. And um, during the process, several of the viewers some distance away reported that their black and white televisions was now in color. They saw the whole thing in color on a black and white TV. And Matthew had this had this effect on electronics in a wow. way that things changed during his appearance, not because he did it purposely, but it was something that happened around him as a result of the, in a sense, the energetic frame within which uh, he functioned in the world. Um, that then led me into um, a relationship with Michael Murphy, as you mentioned, the co-founder of Estima Institute. And at the time he was writing his second novel called Jacob Atabed, which was about a man um, who was born a genius of how consciousness and the body um, collaborate with one another to, to affect dramatic physiological changes 
in the service of higher spiritual unfoldment. And um, because that was something of great interest to me, he and I began talking about this. He wrote a few experiences that were similar to some of the things I had experienced in Russia, in the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia. And so we decided to develop a project to bring together all of the information about this aspect of the uh, of human experience that we called the transformation project and that ultimately became the most comprehensive collection of data on extraordinary human functions that had ever been developed to date um, and it was out of that that then um, Michael and I got more involved with our Soviet colleagues and eventually established what became the Soviet American, um, uh, the Esalen Institute Soviet American program, which you uh, referred to earlier as the beginning of what was called citizen diplomacy. You know, um, you said a lot, but one of the things I wanted to just reflect on brief, briefly, um, you, you and I talked about this earlier, but I recently went to a conference um, that was um, um, sponsored by, um, I'm going to forget, forget his name, um, uh, but in any event, it was called the Archives of the of the of the of the Impossible, and um, in there you talked about these uh, Soviets attempting to influence the president, or at least um, you know influencing him. Apparently, the U.S. government has had similar projects in terms of tra trained um, kind of remote viewing type types of people that would um, ne not necessarily influence, but attempt to locate, uh, for example, where where Islam bin Laden was and all these kind of things. And um, at this particular conference, this person um, drew a, drew a set of um, uh, experiences in terms of their they, these remote sensors essentially being able to identify um, where things are very practically in battlefields and things of that nature, where they do things like um, um, having them concentrate um, basically, and then having them draw a picture uh, of what these particular places on the battlefield were, and then and then it'll be verified. And these so it seems like there was some. Um, um, kind of parallel things that were going on in both governments at the time, and perhaps are probably still going on. So, I mean, well, that's just very yeah. interesting. Well, yes, you're absolutely correct that behind the scenes in the Defense Intelligence Agency yes. and other uh, kind of secret aspects of, of the government, um, money was being channeled into places like the Stanford Research Institute. Yes where at SRI, Hal Putoff and Russell Targ were doing experiments in remote viewing. They were the ones who brought Uri Geller to the US the first time. And it was because I knew them that we were able to borrow Uri for several weeks and, and um, uh, involve him in some of our research. Um, and, and it was an example of the, the degree to which governments were saying, hey, we don't need to prove this anymore. Right. If right. so and so can tell us where such and such is happening, just let us know and we'll start using this. And a, and a part of what emerged out of that was a training program, which began to point to the fact that many people have this capacity if developed in a certain way. And the remote viewing particularly particularly was applied in a number of instances over a number of years to solve important national security questions that had arisen and that were um, more easily um, answered in a sense through some of these, in a sense, psychic talents, let's say. So yeah, I think in both countries, um, not only was there a lot of work going on, but, it's, but it does continue. And partly because we have learned that under certain kinds of, of training programs, many people have some degree of capacities inside of them that can be brought into deployment, let's say, um, in a way that is, is productive for, especially in the military sense, um, national security issues. Uh, and, and, you know, one, one particular comment on that that is now 
underway in a dramatic way is a combination of how the brain uh, processes information and our capacity to acquire information at a distance. And there is now a very uh, concentrated uh, program militarily to combine technology that accesses the brain's um, process of information with a capacity to, ach to acquire information at a distance and use that on a battlefield to deploy to, to, in a sense, deploy soldiers in a way that is using actively accessed information right now by the commander of the, of the, um, of the soldiers, for example, versus a guy sitting back at SRI, right. you know, 10,000 miles away, who's looking at something, then it goes through all the data. And so, you know, there, there's a, um, the, in a sense, the militarization of information, of capacities, obviously, will always be used in a significant way. The advantage of that is they have substantial money to yeah, do the won. research. Right. And then the task is, okay, so how do we, how do we apply this in a, in a wider, more productive use to the population at large? So that's always the challenge from government to the population at large, and it is being explored. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that we could say about that, but um, just as sort of a bridge question, I know that you've done a lot of research um, in recent years about neuroscience and consciousness, and uh, I'll call it spirituality, but let's just say neuroscience and, and, and consciousness. And this is a broad question, it's impossible to answer in kind of a soundbite. But in general, what does that research tell us about human capacities and how we might use it to create a more uh, kind of a robust spiritual practice? Well, I think there's several parts to this. One is that one of the more general interests that emerged out of some of the early parapsychological research was the recognition that there are experienced meditation practitioners around the world, yogis, swamis, spiritual teachers of various kinds who have unusual capacities. And that has been taken into the laboratory and studied yeah. to, su to such a degree that we now know that meditation, mindfulness, different types of meditation, however you want to uh, describe it, has very specific um, impact in centers of the brain that are that are associated with focused attention, um, um, uh, goal acquisition, etc. So that we're now able to link a great many of the brain um, activities with some of these um, unusual abilities in a way that has now encouraged us, for example, to teach mindfulness in elementary school. Because we know that that focused attention um, calms the brain mind in a way that in a sense brings a kind of order into a um, elementary classroom that, that also activates certain parts of the brain in a way that give um, more access to attention and learning. So this is, you know, these are the pieces that have come out of the early parapsychological work and gone more broadly into an understanding of how we work. So the second thing I would say is that, you know, the neuroscience is probably the most studied aspect of science in the last 20 years of anything else we've looked at because we've now understood things like, for example, things like neuroplasticity. So for example, when I took my first physiology class, probably as a senior in high school and through college, I was always taught that by the time you're 25, your brain is set, it can never change again. So for, for you know, the last several 
um, centuries where we've really studied how the brain works, we have believed that until we're 25, we can affect it in some way, but after that, we're done for the rest of our lives. And we now know, it's only about 15, 20 years ago, that we learned that the brain is actually what we call plastic in a sense, that it can be restructured in form and function until we die. However, it takes attention and intention to make that happen. The point is the brain is malleable and it reflects our inner world, our um, emotions, our beliefs, our intentions, and all of that affects our actions. So we can then use some of this, in a sense, mindfulness, meditation, focused attention activity, combined with some emotional work that we would like to have more present in our lives and change the way the brain functions so that we have more access to happiness. We have a better and more productive um, experience every day in the world because of how we refocus our inner world in a way that brings the outer world in more consistency with what we want to experience and who we want to be. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the most important things that I think has come out of the neuroscience in recent years. And, and then the, the last part of this is you combine this with, for example, quantum physics and the, uh, and the recognition and understanding now that at a fundamental level, everything is energy. Mm -hmm. None of this, as Einstein used to say, external reality is an illusion. It's a very compelling and seductive illusion, but it's an illusion all the same, because as he related to it, it's all energy. And matter in its form um, comes out of that energetic frame. And what we found in some of the research is it takes a certain kind of attention on that energetic frame for it to as a for it to manifest into manner. And what they say is at that deepest level of, of the energetic platform, we could call it, all probabilities exist. So there's some element in the universe where all probabilities exist. And as they describe it, when one puts their attention on one probability, that's what makes it manifest in the physical world. So you combine that with the fact that our brain is plastic and we manipulate it, and we have these untapped potentials within our brain, mind, heart system, then the um, right kind of focus and attention and uh, uh, some degree of, of immersion into the fundamental energetic structure of things can bring about an external world that you're, that you're longing for, that you're wishing for. And this is what today has now become a fairly commonplace teaching of a number of, of um, teachers around the world, Bob Proctor and John Asaroff and Joe Vitale and Sonia Ricotti and, and, and Peggy McCall and Ricky Zimmerman, all of whom teach that appropriate focus of attention on the imagination of who we want to become will help us move toward that future version of ourselves in a way that functions because of quantum physics and something parapsychological and neuroplasticity, all of which have come together to begin to make popular the notion that my inner world is actually in, 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 in a sense cahoots with the external world in a way that I can form a mm. life for myself to walk into that is made up of my most incredible dreams of who I want to be and what I want to have and what I want to do and where I want to go, et cetera. So that's where I say mm. parapsychology 
has been a, a, an, a, an important element in the very beginning of informing what today is a personal development practice that has combined parapsychology with quantum physics, with imaginative problem solving and neuroscience, et cetera, to make us believe or to demonstrate for us, depending on your point of view, that our inner world actually can create our outer world in a way that is consistent with our most deepest desires. Great. So uh, as you know, we've got this event coming on May 21st, um, 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and I'll post a link there. And we're calling it parapsychology and you. And I know that you're about practicality at the end of the day. What are some of the <laughs> what are some of the activities or suggestions that you might offer us that will expand our sense of what it means to be human in this exploration that we're going to participate in? Well, I think the context is um, using our inner capacities to have more of the kind of life we really want to live. And so I talk about what I call neuroscience practice guidelines, okay? And I'll just go through a couple of them and then we can go into them in greater detail on the 21st. But for example, what, I, what is called in the industry, and they're not all mine, moments of choice. It's sort of like um, one of the phrases I like is that that Rick Hansen talks a lot about. Rick Hansen, who is both a psychotherapist and a neuroscientist. And he says, life is made of minutes. We have a brain that's constantly changing its structure according to how we feel and believe and, and think. And, based, and that constant restructuring is based on minutes, this minute, and then this minute. And as Rick says to me, the opportunity is to turn good moments into a great brain. Mm -hmm. So recognize that every minute is a moment of choice. We have a choice about how we feel because someone said something that made us upset and or that made us feel wonderful. And so each one of those moments is a time when we choose, as they say in the industry, to either respond or react. And this is a brain thing. Um, our brain has evolved over the last 300,000 years, as they say, um, to have a negativity bias. Mm. We are biased toward remembering and, and, um, and becoming excited by negative experiences because that's what ensured our survival 250,000 years ago. As Rick often says, um, I, can, I can make a mistake about there being a lion in the grass a hundred times and I'll be okay. But if I make a mistake once, I'm gone from the gene pool. So the brain um, relies on, I, I, you know, th something I always think about is I'm walking down the woods and someone steps on a stick and the grass and everybody, oh, there's a snake, you know? And then you look and it's like, oh, it's okay. It was just a <laughs> twig that broke. But that activates a part of the brain mm -hmm. that is the flight or fight aspect of the brain mm -hmm. in the amygdala. And so we have the capacity not to change it, but to not allow it to dictate how we respond in life the way it was important to survival so many years ago. And each moment we have a choice about, I walk in, you know, for example, um, your son brings his or, or your child brings his or her report card home and has straight A's and one C. And the typical parent response is, why did you get a C? Versus, wow, you got straight A's. And yeah, there's a little improvement over here. That's a choice of responding or reacting mm. because the reaction is from the negativity bias. Look at what you did wrong versus you respond to the positive side and life from that moment on takes a different flavor mm. than the one when you were criticized by your mother for doing one thing wrong. So these are moments of choice. The next thing is what I call, and this is something that I, that I coined the phrase, 
back pocket positivity. Because once again, um, there are so many times in the daily life when our negativity arises, you know, somebody cuts you off in traffic or somebody in the bank line is taking too much time and I'm in a hurry, come on. Da, da, da. And so what I teach with our students is remember a time when you had an extraordinary experience in life. It was so great. It enlivened all of you. And you just felt so wonderful for so long. I mean, for example, I have, a, I have an experience of my own. Um, when I was in high school, I was a basketball player. And in one of the playoff games for the championship, I stole the ball, I was dribbling down the court and, and the, the uh, defender came up and I was about to make a layup and he was about to get me. And I threw a behind the back pass to my friend who took it and dunked the and the crowd went wild, you know? And I still, you can tell, I still remember it with glee. So I say, remember a few of these experiences and keep them in your back pocket. So when a, um, an extreme event occurs, you can pull it out and reignite within you the extraordinary experience you one ha once had. And that changes the whole flavor mm -hmm. of what just happened. So, you know, there are other things like gratitude and acts of kindness and, and um, other actions we can take in the world that emerge out of an inner sense of doing something worthwhile for someone else or yourself. And we'll talk more about that on the May 21st class. Yeah, it's going to be uh, delightful. Um, Jim will probably give us a background on a lot of different things, and then we'll we'll see how it's applied to us. At the end of the day, that's what we're all all here for. We're trying to have like um, you know, a more um, whole, more satisfying lives. And now there's um lots of research that we've learned to, to help us do that. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, it's going to be May 21st, um, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you'll see a link and everything like that. Thank you so much, Jim. <laughs> Thank you. And Joe, it's always fun to talk with you about this stuff. I hope all of you who are listening also had a good time today. <laughs>